What does one house say to the other? What does one house say to the other? How's it going? <laughs> All right. Um, this one's got a little bit more to it. This is my anti Alzheimer deck. It keeps me sharp. What happens when you eat yeast and shoe polish? I would advocate this. <laughs> what happens when you eat yeast and shoe polish? Rise and shine. <laughs> All right, let's talk about cancer. So cancer is a field that uh, gained a tremendous amount of interest and popularity. Cancer is something that has been around for a long time. In fact, we have early medical records that we review now retrospectively. <coughs> We see case studies of patients, even on autopsy, and we read these accounts of what was going on and, and the records that are being taken and the stuff that's written down in the journals. It's pretty clear they didn't know what it was, but it was probably cancer. Okay? And you can see this take place with lots of different diseases. You know, many of these diseases that we sort of discover um, are around for a long time. It's just we don't have the tools or the capability or the knowledge to understand what we're dealing with. Um, cardiovascular disease has been around for a long time, right? The term angina, meaning chest pain, has been around for centuries. But um, the thought of this chest pain or the strangling in the chest, uh, it was unknown as to what it was a result of. Sometimes, you know, um, it was something that patients would eat and it would give them a pain in the chest or a burning in the chest and they'd call it heartburn. So it, it's just a little bit of, of history to, um, to demonstrate that even though it's sort of a newer field, like in the last half century, cancer research has become extremely popular. It has been with us for a long time. And our bodies do a pretty good job of fighting it. Our bodies do a really good job of fighting it uh, every day. Um, but, you know... And you probably know loved ones or family members or friends that are wrestling with cancer or have struggled with cancer, or maybe they passed from cancer, and you're saying, wow, it seems a lot more prevalent. Um, well, that, it might be the case, but I would argue it's probably because we're detecting it. We know more of what to look for. And a lot of those things that were present hundreds of years ago were still happening. We just didn't know it was cancer. So what is it? Well, it's very simple at the top level. Then it gets super complex. At the top level, cancer cells are your own cells. You can't catch it from your neighbor. It's not an infectious disease. Okay? It's not something that uh, you're at risk of, of, of getting if you travel to another country, even something as strange as the UK. Okay? or other more exotic places. Um, it's your own cells that mutate and they grow out of control. So you have what we call uncontrolled cellular growth. And you typically form a new growth. And that new growth is a word we call a neoplasm. A neoplasm is a new growth within a tissue that's not supposed to be there. Um, when that tissue grows, you can see from this picture of normal tissue on the left, and you can see a dysplasia from here. What does that mean? Dysplasia is a word that means malformation. So that tissue is malformed now. It looks different than it normally or originally looked. So something caused it to change or mutate. And this dysplasia can actually form this neoplasm, or this new growth. And that's uncontrolled growth that should have stayed within these borders that you're seeing. This is the gut in the intestine. This is the mucosal layer in the intestine. And it should have stayed within those nice defined borders, but because there was a mutation, now it's actually growing this new growth out of control. 
Now, if it sort of branches out and invades other surrounding tissues and stays in this misbehaving fashion, then it's, it's considered an invasive neoplasm. So it's moving in different types of ways. If we look at the differences in the stages of new growths or neoplasms, right, and these are what we call tumors. Tumor is a neoplasm. A neoplasm is a type of tumor. And so we've got all these terms that we throw out. Well, we have two main types of tumors or neoplasms that we can look at. Number one is something that we refer to as benign. Okay, this is the one we get the phone call and we say, oh, good news. Yeah, really? What? It's benign. What does that mean? Well, it's not the bad kind of cancer. Oh, sweet. Okay. Or the unfortunate call is, you know what? They said it was malignant. Okay. What does that mean? Well, that means that it's invasive and it's, it's aggressively moving beyond the borders of where it should be. So a benign tumor is slow growing. There's a low level of mitosis. It has a well-defined border. It stays within the region that it's supposed to. Usually, if you just go and surgically remove it, you're fine. They'll take a little bit of the margin, which is the healthy tissue around it, and that's for a safety measure to make sure they've got it all. And they'll biopsy both the core and they'll biopsy the margin and make sure that the margin is healthy and it doesn't look weird. And then that pathology report comes back a couple of weeks later and say, you know what? Mr. Smith, uh, we're probably going to be fine. Okay? It looks like we got everything and we got plenty of margin tissue, and I'm not worried about it. We're just going to keep an eye on it and see if it comes back. Okay? The benign the tumor is non invasive, it's not really trying to move anywhere else, it's staying in location. The cells are well differentiated. That means those cells look like the cells that they came from. So if this is in the skin, it still looks like skin cells. If it's in the uterus, it still looks like uterine tissue. If it's in the lung, it still looks like lung and filling. <coughs> if it's in the colon, it still has the resemblance of the colonic epithelial tissue. So no metastasis means it doesn't break off and go somewhere else, distantly or downstream. And we really don't call this cancer. We call it a benign tumor. Now, it is a nomenclature, or we might say it's precancerous. Okay? They might say, the phone call might say, well, it, it wasn't uh, full cancer yet. Oh, cool. What does that mean? Well, we're probably talking about non invasive benign tumor. And they think they got it all. Wonderful. Well, you can see the histology. Here is a benign leomyoma out of um, uh, the uterus. And you can see the tissue here looks like uterine smooth muscle. Now, if we look over here at the malignant side versus meaning in contrast, this one grows very rapidly, very aggressively. It has an undefined border, meaning it does not obey where those borders are, and it just kind of grows wherever it wants to. It invades the local tissues. You can kind of see from the diagram that it's moving into the surrounding tissue as well. It becomes poorly differentiated, meaning it no longer resembles the uterine smooth muscle. You can see here, even at areas of necrosis, because that tissue is growing and the mass is getting larger, and so it develops a necrotic core because it can't keep up with the vascular vascularization of the tissue that it's adding to because it's growing at such a fast rate. Um, metastasis is very possible. This is what we worried about. They say. Uh, the language would be, uh, well, it was malignant. However, we think we got it all. We just don't know yet if it's metastasized somewhere else. And like, what does that mean? Well, the problem is if it doesn't obey these borders and it branches off and it gets into the bloodstream, then that cancerous tissue can migrate downstream and invade another location. It's going to invade another location. It's very common for secondary metastatic sites to be areas like the liver, because the liver is a large filter organ that filters the blood. And so that would go through the liver and get trapped, and then you'd have a secondary met or metastases in the liver. So in the case of chronic smokers that develop lung cancer, 
the lung cancer itself is usually not the long-term problem. They develop lung cancer, but, but because the lungs are so well vascularized, when that, if it's a metastatic lung cancer, it can get everywhere in the body, to the bone, to the liver. And so all of these, you know, you hear these, well, we went in and it was everywhere. That's what that means. How did it get everywhere? It has spread. Well, they don't spread magically. They spread based upon entering into different cavities and spaces or systems of perfusion, like the lymphatics, the bloodstream, or into cavities, like in the abdominal space. Okay, we'll get into that here uh, in a little bit. So this side would be considered cancer, and you can see that this uh, neomyosarcoma looks very, very different from uterus and muscle. So the terminology as we continue on, this neoplasia or a neoplasm means a new growth. It's new growth of your own tissue. But these neoplastic cells, we say, are transformed. This word transformation means that they move from one state to a totally different state. And if they're transformed, then they no longer obey the regulatory cell cycle influences that you study. When the cell is going to go through a replication cycle, there are all these checkpoints that you manage, right? You have a gap one and you have a gap two. You're looking for the integrity of the DNA before you actually replicate to say, should I actually allow this to take place? You can pause it, you can make corrections, or you can signal it for apoptosis. So you know what, this is beyond repair. Let's just not allow this to replicate. We want to maintain fidelity of the genome. Well, in cancer, it, it takes shortcuts. It doesn't behave that way, so it just continues to go. So this transformation is what gives rise to this cancerous form. We're going to talk about this in just a, a couple of slides. Here is shown an oral neoplasia. So this is one that would form like under the tongue. So you, you ever gone to the dentist and, and said, well, now we're going to do an oral exam? And they want you to put your tongue on the roof. They may grab a four by four, grab your tongue, pull it up, down, side, right? They're looking, they're looking for these kinds of things in the oral mucosa. And one of the reasons they're looking at the oral mucosa is we put an awful lot of external things in our mouth all day long, okay? Um, a lot of the foods that we eat, okay? A lot of the drinks that we have. So there's an awful lot of potential DNA damaging substances that we put into our oral cavity. Okay? Well, it also ends up in our colon too, right? So that's why when you get to a certain age, especially if you're a male, right, beyond 50, now you're going to have pretty regular colonoscopies to look to see, do we see little growths like this as a result of substances sitting in close proximity to that mucosa causing damage to the DNA in them? allowing it to mutate. Okay. All right, so if we continue on, we're going to come back to some of these things. What causes mutation? We'll get there. How does it work? We'll get there. Are we going to be able to cover everything in the realm of cancer in, in, in this? No, no. In, in the first half and the second half of today, can we do it? Absolutely not. I'm just here to try to get you interested in the space, become a little familiar with a field that's really, really exploiting. Okay, many of you probably uh, will be dealing with and treating and spending time with cancer patients um, as you move on in your uh, profession. Well, a lot of these different cancers are named based upon the tissue or the location that they show up. So, for example, um, if we look at the first one on this list, a carcinoma. A carcinoma is a, usually referring to a transformed epithelial cell epithelial cell. So it's superficial. Uh, transformed epithelial cell like the skin. Um, you see this image of a basal cell carcinoma on the upper right, on the nose. Okay, so the uh, other one that you would get commonly in this location would be a squamous cell carcinoma at the level of the epithelium. So these carcinomas are epithelial types of cancers. An adenocarcinoma usually targets glandular tissue, the epithelium of glandular tissue. 
like, for example, prostate, right? The prostate. That's this lower image here, is prostate uh, adenocarcinoma. So the glands that you're looking at are the small uh, crowded glands that are showing up, like these guys right here. This is more of a normal gland. Here's a normal one. These are all small crowd. This was a crowded one. These are these adenocarcinomas in the middle of the slide, and these larger glands that border it are what they should look like. So these guys are kind of dividing on their own and making new prostate tissue in the case of prostate adenocarcinoma, glandular tissue. A sarcoma. This is usually connective tissue. Connective tissue, like from the mesoderm. A leukemia. Leukemia is usually a cancer of the blood or the bone marrow. I don't have a picture of a sarcoma in this slide. This leukemia of the blood is this middle panel on the right side. So cancer of the blood or the bone, that's a blood uh, smear that's being shown right there. A lymphoma. A lymphoma is a cancer of what? What do you think? Within the lymphatics, the lymphatic circulation or lymphoid tissue. So you have lymphatics everywhere. This is actually a lymphoma in the arm. It, it looks like like the gastrocnemius with the arm at the bottom, doesn't it? But that's actually the arm, or the hand at the bottom. This is the arm. So that that's a lymphoma that's sitting in the lymphatic side of the circulation. Now we have this term that's shown up. It's more of a clinical term. It's called adeno. Uh, I'm sorry, a carcinoma in situ or a CIS. Carcinomas in situ are described as kind of an early form of cancer or pre-cancer. It doesn't have invasive types of cells. Um, usually, a carcinoma in situ is referring to the fact that you found the tumor in a location before it's compromised the basal membrane. So carcinoma in location is what it's saying. In situ means in location. So a, a tumor in location means, you know, good news, we kind of isolated it. Let's get it out of there before it moves on beyond uh, the borders. Um, so a lot of times the lesion is very flat. Okay, it's going to affect um, organs like the skin, the cervix. Okay, you might find um, it in breast and lung tissue as well. And um, the carcinomas in situ are ones like in the case of breast cancer, it would be a breast tumor that would be a nodule, but it actually hasn't perforated the basement membrane to actually go beyond the borders. And breast tissue is extremely well vascularized. Question? Um, benign carcinoma in situ, not the same thing, right? Um, a carcinoma in situ is by definition benign. So in a way they are. They're very similar. Again, the benign versus malignant is more like scientific literature terminology, and the CIS is kind of what the clinical realm refers to it. They usually say it's a, a CIS or carcinoma in situ versus benign. Okay. Lots of terminology, I know. All right, so let's look at an image that's talking about a polyp. This is a polyp within the colon. And if you remember the colon epithelium, right, you have these wave patterns of ridges, right? You have these villi or absorption and secretion within the intestines. And this structure at the very top is a transformed neoplasia, right? This is a glandular tumor or a adenoma that's projecting out. It is benign, so um, it's not migrating through the basement membrane. You know it's benign because it's moving this direction instead of perforating the basement membrane and moving this direction. But this would be a polyp that would show up. This is obviously from a biopsy on a colonoscopy. They came in and they took a punch of tissue and then they analyzed the biopsy to say, yeah, those are polyps that we so how do they remove them? Well, there's a couple of ways that they're done. A lot of times they're done uh, by just tying them off. 
all right, banding them with like rubber bands, okay, um, and and then they're snipped. Uh, in some cases, that they'll be tied off, snipped, and cauterized in locations so that it doesn't bleed extensively. Okay, but removing these polyps, um, if they're benign, is not really a huge deal. So if you have, it's it's more common in men over the age of 50. I'll go in for a colonoscopy. Say, oh yeah, they they like cut out like 12 polyps. I'm like, sweet, high five, Dad. Okay, <laughs> nice work. Um, so it, it's not really unusual now. Now, 100 years ago, we didn't do this. You didn't go in for a routine colonoscopy and then have polyps removed. Okay. So the prevalence of colon cancer is, is, is pretty high, but we're also utilizing many more uh, medical procedures in order to intervene early. Now, if you let this thing go, uh, the concern is that if it becomes malignant, it perforates that basement membrane and it moves on. Now, how do these cells become cancerous? So I talked about this transformation. So let me explain what that means using a bench top assay. So this is uh, a Petri dish. When we grow cells in the laboratory, and we do this in my lab, we grow a number of different cells. We don't grow cancer cells. But if we did, this is what you would see. If you look at the top slide, we've got what we call density-dependent inhibition of growth signals. So normal cells are up top. What this means is, Normally, in a petri dish, cells will grow, and they'll grow really aggressively, and then once they start running out of space, they slow down their growth. And that's normally how cells behave. That's how cells behave in the body. So if you have a wound or a lesion, those fibroblasts in the skin are going to move like crazy to cover it up and fill the gap, and then once there's no more space to fill, they sort of settle down. You know, they take a lunch break. So they're inhibited by contact, meaning once they get to a critical density, okay, and they're filled in, they slow down their growth rate. It's regulated by the cell cycle. This is what's supposed to happen. It makes sense. You're out of room. Why would you replicate again? Cancer cells lose that anchorage dependency. They lose this inhibition of slowing down. So what they do is they just start growing on top of each other. And they just grow on top, and they'll grow on top of each other at the expense of creating a necrotic center. Like, it's too bad, it's your fault, you're so far away from all the nutrition, bummer. And they just continue to grow, and then they kill the cells underneath because they're too far away from nutrition. So this anchorage independency, or being independent of anchorage dependency, is a characteristic cancer um, that is indicative of their transformation. Now, this uh, autonomy, meaning they behave all on their own without any influences of cell regulation. They're immortal. What does that mean? Okay, this isn't you know like you know the Twilight series or anything weird like that. But this term immortal means that cells will divide in our body. Um, with a defined lifespan. Meaning that cells will replicate and divide after a period of time they get tired and they stop dividing. Okay, and that probably happens somewhere between the ages of 70 and 100 years of age. Why does that take place? Well, we don't really know. We have some clues we'll talk about here in a little bit. But cancer cells don't run out of energy for division. In fact, cancer cells um, when you freeze a cancer cell line, a primary cancer cell line, that primary cancer cell line can be used for hundreds of years from the exact same cell. Okay? Some students in here grow cells in the laboratory and they know, can you use the same cell line and replicate it out population after population indefinitely? How long can fibroblasts go approximately in your experience? Yeah. So passage 9, passage 10. Passage meaning you get a population, that's a generation. You split it, you grow it again, that's passage 2. You split it, grow it again, that's passage two. Those are generations of cells. So we put them on a bench top and grow them in culture. Fibroblasts from the skin only go about 9 to 10 passages. 
then they're done. Okay? In fact, if you get them really, really old, like passage 15, you'll put them in and they hardly grow. They're just like, oh, what a man. Okay? And they, hardly, they hardly replicate at all. And, and we'll talk about why that is. It has to do with their telomere lengths. Okay? But cancer cells do not run out of gas. They are actually immortal. They continue to grow and replicate out of control. In fact, the most popularized cell line that was a cancer cell line that we're still studying today from the original primary isolation in the 1950s is what cancer cell line? The HeLa cell line. Who said that? The HeLa cell line. So it stands for Henrietta Lacks, okay? And she had cervical cancer. And her surgeon uh, took a biopsy, and then after she had passed, went back and looked at the tissue and found some interesting characteristics and gave a sample to their, his friends, because that's what scientists do. Hey, happy birthday. Here's some cancer cells. Okay. Woo, right? So he gave some cancer cells to his friends. His friend gave some to his other friend on his birthday. And, and now the HeLa cell line is the most popularized cancer cell line in a research environment. And Henry Adelax has been dead for decades. And her cells are still being grown in the laboratory because they're immortal. Okay? Yes? Can you just elaborate a little bit on the anchorage independence? What does that mean? Does it mean so that's this contact. So, so, uh, so these guys up here aren't anchored to anything. Uh, you see, these guys down here are anchored to the bottom of the plate. And you coat the plate with proteins that resemble the basement membrane. Uh -huh. So like, you know, that means that I am supposed to be walking along this basement membrane, and this is where I feel comfortable. But Anchorage independency is if these cells don't need to be attached to a basement membrane, that's why they grow on top of each other. Uh, okay. Do you know why they cannot run out of gas? Like, yeah, this, so this is the telomere length. So we're going to talk about it in just a minute. Can you repeat what autonomy means again? Autonomy? autonomy? Yeah, so this is they behave on their own outside of cell cycle <laughs> regulation. So they ignore gap one and they ignore gap two. Now, a couple of other terms that we need to talk about are anaplasia and pleomorphic. Anaplasia is a term that means that they've lost their organization. They've lost their organization. And a second characteristic of anaplastic cells is they have an increase in the nucleus size. And that should make sense because the nuclear activity is ramped up because their mitotic divisions are increased. Okay, so their cell uh, center actually swells. Like we're going to start replicating like crazy. So the nucleus actually enlarges. Now the second term is pleomorphic. Pleomorphic is a word that refers to abnormal or variable shape and size. So if it's a skeletal muscle. They're supposed to be about this size and diameter, then they might be like this big, or they might be that big, or they might be that big. Okay? So pleomorphic or pleomorphism is variable shape and size. Now, oftentimes you're going to see both of those together histologically, and I'll show you some histology here in a minute that talks about that. But before we go there, let's answer this question of how do cells become more? So this is this is kind of the holy grail of the search for the fountain of youth, right? Because if you can figure out why do our cells run out of the abilities to divide, why are they not immortal like cancer cells, then you answer the question of how could we avoid death, physical death? Because at the end of life, systems just start shutting down. Assuming that there's no um, underlying disease process. If someone dies truly of just old age and you watch an individual pass away, it's actually a very peaceful process. Okay, And this happens under hospice care. right? And things get painful and comfortable because the body's shutting down. And so what hospice does is manage that, those symptoms with a lot of pain medication <coughs> and making the patient comfortable. But we're not going in there and fixing this or fixing that. You're, you're just trying to comfort patient as their passive. But if you watch this process, it's actually quite interesting. It, there, there's some beauty in the sense that the physical body is starting to turn off. But why is that? Okay, so the thought process is these telomeres. 
So these telomeres um, are repeats that show up at the end of the DNA. They're little DNA bumpers, if you will. And they're mostly on the three prime end of the DNA strand. And what happens is they get a little shorter every time the cell replicates. And then there's an enzyme known as telomerase that actually extends the length of the telomere back to close to its original length. So the next time it goes through a cell division and it shortens, the telomerase lengthens it again. And so you go through this process of shortening and lengthening for 70, 80 years, and eventually you have shorter telomeres. And when you run out of telomere length, you compromise the ability of that cell to replicate. Okay? So that's how telomeres work in a nutshell. Now, if we look at stem cells, and we look at germ cell lines, and we look at cancer cell lines, these guys all have something in common, and that are really long telomeres. In this situation, length does matter. Okay. These guys have these long telomeres that give them the ability to replicate continuously. Now that's incredibly important at the level of the germ cell, right? Look at the germ cell. Look at the length of the telomere. Very long, the longest that we have in the body. And it has an unlimited ability for cellular divisions. Because at the level of the germ cells, at the level of the gametes, that's the propagation of the species. So you don't want that to run out during the reproductive age of the organism, okay? Now, just beneath that are stem cells. You can see stem cells over time start to wear out, but it makes sense that if you have stem cells like in the level of the stratum basali layer of the skin, or in the level of the colon in the small intestine or the large intestine, or the, um, sorry, the GI tract, or the colon, large intestine, or the small intestine, you want that epithelium to turn over. So you don't want short telomeres. You want to make sure that you can turn over your skin or your gut every six to eight weeks. And so you need fidelity, and you need long telomeres to be able to do that. Most of the other cells in our body have this definitive lifespan, where they reach a point where the telomeres are too short, now they no longer can grow. Now what happens at the level of uh, cancer mutation is one of the mutations that makes it cancerous is lengthening telomeres. Lengthening telomeres. So even in our adult stem cells, we have stem cells as adults in these organs we talked about that have longer telomeres. And it makes sense because they're regenerative tissue. So I was reading this coffee table magazine a couple years back, this is 2011, it's a little old. 2011, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, this one caught my eye. This was, you know, it looked kind of, I guess I remember the Matrix movies. You guys see those? Um, so these Matrix movies, um, you know, they had this, you know, people connected. That's what this reminded me of, it was like Neo with the, you know, board in the back of his head. So I had to read this thing, it was just fascinating. But they're talking about two, 2045, where uh, is the year that we become immortal. And, Captured within this was this article that I'm going to highlight. The, the, there was lots of articles about immortality, but the piece that was the most interesting that caught my eye was, and it's shown up right here in this in this red box. Okay, um, so this guy looks like this could be Flagstaff, judging by this character, right? <laughs> but, um, but you know it's not because look at all that water. <laughs> it's like, oh no no, that's not Flag. Look at all the water. Um, but maybe he was born here. Um, <laughs> So, if you look at this red box, I'm going to read this to you because I'm not sure you can appreciate it. It says, um, this is Time Magazine, okay, but check the science, it's actually pretty interesting. Because they're talking about a publication that was published in Nature. So they're just reporting on a Nature Pub. Uh, but they did a pretty good job. Every time a cell divides, its telomeres get shorter. And once a cell runs out of telomeres, it can't reproduce anymore and dies. But there's an enzyme called telomerase that reverses this process. It's one of the reasons cancer cells live so long. So why not treat regular non-cancerous cells with telomerase? In November of 2011, researchers at Harvard Medical School announced in Nature, which is a top-tier science publication, 
that they had done just that. They administered telomerase to a group of mice suffering from age-related degeneration. The damage went away, and the mice didn't just get better, they got younger. So I pulled that paper, and I've read it, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to belabor the point. This is kind of the fountain of youth research. But this is what cancer cells do. So in 1985 is where this research actually started. And it was Blackburn, Elizabeth Blackburn, a woman at UC Berkeley, and her graduate student, another woman, Carol uh, Greeter, who's now over at Johns Hopkins, they actually discovered telomerase. They're the two women responsible for the discovery of telomerase, knowing that it's there. It's always been there, but they're the ones that found it, okay? And um, they characterized this, and they published it, and it was their work that they're talking about here. Um, uh, that, uh, uh, that this Time magazine was, was, was uh, popularizing. But what's interesting is in 2009, they actually won jointly the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for their uh, discovery of telomerase. Okay. So you're going to probably see more of this type of research. In fact, there's a company that's working with telomerase for age-related problems um, right now. Okay. Uh, and they're trying to leverage these kinds of pieces of research to see uh, what can we do outside of cancer for aging normal cells. All right, so back to cancer. A little sidebar, we'll come back. It sounds like this crowd really wants organization. <laughs> All right, let's pretend we get to play doctor, okay, for a minute, appropriately. <laughs> you just told your patient that he has a lipoma. He expresses concerns because a family member, his sister, was recently diagnosed with a liposarcoma, and it sounds like he has the same thing or a similar thing. So what do you tell your patient to calm down? Benign. How do you know it's benign? It It is, it is, it has a nice margin around it, or border around it, so it's contained. I agree. You talk about those previous slides we went over about the difference between benign and malignant, but the reason you know it's benign is because of the language, right? Usually, um, the uh, suffix oma means benign, and the suffix uh, carcinoma or sarcoma or blastoma are usually things that are going to be more malignant in nature. Okay. Now, not always. We're running out of words in terminology, but that's usually a general rule. When you see a lipoma versus a liposarcoma, one is benign and the other one is malignant. Okay. So back to anaplasia and pleomorphism. So here are two examples that I want to showcase. I'm going to dim the lights just so you can see the histology a little bit more cleanly. This is actually from your textbook. The top image is what kind of tissue? What does that tissue look like? Muscle. That's, yeah, it's muscle. It looks like um, skeletal muscle. That's exactly what it is. Now, down in panel B, just below it, what is that? You're like, I have no idea. No, that was messed up. <laughs> that is actually was skeletal muscle. It's an anaplastic tumor, bless you, inside skeletal muscle. I wasn't blessing the tumor, I was blessing the brain. Um, it's called the rhabdomyosarcoma. R-H-A-B-D-O. M-Y-O-S-A-R-C-O-M-A. So let's take a peek at what we see as differences between the two. I mean, they're dramatic, so who wants to point some out? What's that? Enlarged nuclei. Okay? That's a characteristic of anaplasia. Look at the size of this monster. Okay? All of these are like, look, look at the normal size of the nuclei, right? Skeletal muscle is multinucleated, right? Remember that? And these can be multinucleated, but look at the relative size. Now, what about the organization? This is nicely organized in pattern, as you remember from 201, and look at the loss of organization. So those are characteristics of anaplasia. Now, 
The second one of pleomorphism is we have variable shapes and sizes. For the most part, all of these myocytes are about the same size, relatively speaking. In comparison, if I look at this guy versus look at this guy, and look at all these ones over here. So we have really small ones, we have really large ones. We have variable shape and size, which is pleomorphism. So the disclaimer is you're typically going to see these two features together in a cancerous tumor. But I want you to be able to understand what term refers to what definition. Now, how do we keep track of cancer in patients? How do we track it over time or mark it? Well, we have markers. So let's talk a little bit about how these tumor markers work. Why do we use them? What's the logic behind it? <clears throat> now, every tissue in the body is going to have a protein tag on its surface. Right? When we talk about the immune system, we talk about MHC classes. Remember that? But we also know that a myocyte a, smooth, a skeletal myocyte, a cardiac myocyte, neural tissue, breast tissue, connective tissue in the dermis, they're all going to have different surface marker expressing proteins that tell the body that I'm connective tissue that belongs in the skin, I'm um, cartilaginous tissue that, it, that belongs in between two vertebral discs, Okay, so all of these tissues have proteins expressed on their surface. So you're going to find markers on all cells in the body. And that's typically what we pay attention to. These are what we use as our markers indicating tumors. Let me explain. So they can be found on the plasma membrane, that's the PM. You can find them in the blood, in circulation. You can find them in the spinal fluid. You can find them in the urine. Okay? Um, and Let's take one example first in men, and we'll take a second one in, in women. PSA. PSA stands for what? What do you know? Prostate specific antigen. So, what is the name? Right, scientists are not usually all that creative. So, where do you think that's found? <laughs> On the, right? It's found in the blood, but where does it come from? It comes from the prostate. The prostate gland creates this antigen as it functions, and you find traces of that in the blood in men. Don't find it in women. Why? It's not your question, but there's no prostate. <laughs> so PSA is an antigen that's in circulation in the bloodstream of men. Everyone in this room has a PSA level that's a man. Okay. And that PSA level, we could actually, we're going to change this from a, a brain map to PSA levels, right? Uh, so let's say that um, this is time here. Let's say this is in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and your 50s. And here's relative PSA levels. Well, let's say that your PSA levels are something like this. Okay? And that's a normal curve. Like, what? It's going up. You're like, yeah. So the prostate then enlarges slightly as we get older. Okay, so PSA levels are going to also rise because you have more tissue making more PSA. Now, what happens though if you see this all of a sudden? What do you surmise if I showed you a graph and now all of a sudden um, you've been tracking this patient and they're on this line because prostate cancer ran in the family. So in their 20s, they're in a physical exam for intramural competitive sports. Uh, a blood sample was taken and we have a baseline of PSA levels. Not uncommon. And so now we know historically that this 
ethnic Caucasian male in their 20s is tracking with other ethnic Caucasian males on this line. And now all of a sudden, though, at 50 years of age, we're higher than what is considered normal. So what do you think is going on in this? I said ethnic Caucasian male because in every ethnic group, you're going to have slightly different levels. Right, so that's the alarming concern is, is there a tumor or is there cancer of the prostate that's enlarging the prostate, giving more tissue to make more PSA, and that's what's responsible for that green line. So then we come in and we biopsy the prostate, discover, is there abnormal prostate tissue there, and do we need to remove the prostate before it actually becomes malignant? Does that make sense? So that's how we use a normal antigen marker that's made in all the males in this room, but we get baseline information and we compare it to historical data that we have in medical records. And that gives the doctor an understanding of, you know, you know what, Mr. Smith, um, if you were at this green line, I'd be a little concerned. But you know what, right now, you came in and you're right here at this red line. A little bit higher than where you should be. So you know what? I want you to come back in six months. Usually come in every year. Why don't you come back in six months? And I want to see if, if this red line is going like this or if the red line moves to this point. If it moves to that point, we're probably going to need to go in and get some biopsies. And that's how that conversation would probably go. Okay, so now let's switch over to a, a female example. Um, Pro 2. Conveniently, it's called her too, instead of like him, five or something. <laughs> Human epidermal growth factor receptor two. So this is a receptor that's found prevalently in um, uh, breast tissue. And in, in breast tissue, it's going to respond to estrogen very aggressively. And so this receptor responds to estrogen during adolescence and the breast tissue develops, okay, in certain phases of life, during the menstrual cycle, during pregnancy, etc. there's going to be activity uh, in the breast tissue of females. But we could also, um, it's a little bit more complicated, right, than this single graph because there's going to be some cycles. But we could actually look and track HER2 levels. Um, and this is a receptor that's not found in the blood. It's only found in the tissue on the breast tissue itself. It's not released into the blood. So you can't get a baseline as easily in the 20s without taking a biopsy of breast tissue. And not a lot of 20-year-olds, females, are going in voluntarily for breast tissue samples to get a baseline for two-level expression. Okay? Now, if breast cancer runs in the family, that might be something that they start doing. In fact, there are some you know, pretty high profile folks like Angelina Jolie who had uh, a double mastectomy prophylactically. I don't know if you guys knew that. So she had both the breasts removed because it ran so aggressively in the family and she just didn't want to have to worry about that. Okay? Uh, and she's definitely not in an age group where breast cancer is prevalent. And she did this a couple years ago. So her two, levels, let's say on self-exam, let's play this out, on self-exam, oh, uh, the female no the woman notices a, uh, a lump, goes in to the doctor, they say, yep, there's definitely a lump, and we don't, it's, we don't see it on the other side, um, it wasn't there last month, any time during the month, so we know it's not related to the, the cycle, um, uh, we should probably take, take an image, let's get uh, a view of what's going on, so they schedule a mammogram. On mammogram, that lights up as a lesion, and that's a lesion that's large enough, it looks isolated, and then the doctor probably would say, um, let's go in and take a biopsy of that. Under biopsy, they're going to screen for HER2 levels, and they're going to compare it to historic <coughs> HER2 levels histologically to see if HER2 expression is upregulated, or if those cells are maybe HER2 negative or HER2 positive, and they'll give a read on whether they need to go in and take out that tissue based on her two levels. Okay? So you could you can see the map. Those are the two I really want you to focus on. You can find, um, like in lung cancer, 
you got this CA125 um, in um, colon cancer. We have the CEA. CEA is expressed in a lot of other regions like stomach, uh, pancreas, uh, ovaries, as well as uh, lung and breast. Um, and so we have multiple antigen markers that we can use to track patients' degree, uh, disease progression or to screen, or in some cases for diagnosis, like what we just did with this individual that was on the green line. We say, you know what, that, that makes us a little nervous, so let's take a biopsy and see if we need to take that tissue out. Questions? All right, let's take a break and we'll come back and pick it up right here. Thank <laughs> you.